once, I bumped into a man from um, the Blood Reserve in Alberta who told me that in his opinion for Native people, humor was the WD-40 of healing. Mm -hmm. And I heard that and I thought that is so cool. And it's true, I mean, I've been to 150 First Nation communities across Canada, the United States, and everyone I've been to, I've been greeted with a laugh, a smile, and a joke. And to me, that is the essence of the Native experience. And um, so it became important to me to make sure it was reflected in a lot of our, in, in a lot of my work. The library was my space, and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the voice to have a time. Bonjour, it's such a pleasure to be here and to be with Drew on stage. Thank you, Elspeth. Um, I want to thank the Toronto Public Library for welcoming us here, and um, it's a beautiful space. And to thank Elspeth, David, and of course, Sergio of the Toronto Public Libraries. Now, it's my great pleasure to be here with you, Drew Hayden Taylor. We've known each other for, gosh. Uh, several think, decades. Uh, yeah. It's Let's been, put it this way. We have a history. <laughs> <laughs> it's been 30 years-ish that we've known each other. And over those 30 years, you've written... 30-ish fiction, non-fiction. Um, plays. I, plays. I was like, oh my God. 25 plays, I think it says here at the front of this book. Now I can't find it. <laughs> um, I, I was amazed. I believe this is my 35th book. What? Wow. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Oof. That's Impressive. Well, what else am I going to do? I don't garden. <laughs> and what did, what did you say backstage? You have no children. I have no children and no hobbies. And no <laughs> hobbies. So he just writes. So um, over these years, you know, I, I've, I, I've always been curious. Where and how <clears throat> have you learned your gift to story? Well, the funny thing is, um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, seriously. Um, I remember, well, one of the reasons I became a writer, and this is, I think, goes to my childhood on the reserve, is the fact that I discovered as a writer, you had more control over the universe you create than the universe you live in. And I like that. Wow. Yeah. Now, but the thing being, I remember wanting to explore the world of, of writing, and I remember going to my grade 11 English teacher, because this is when I first came, came of, uh, curious about the industry, and I started doing what a lot of Native youth do. I went to those older and wiser than me to seek guidance and wisdom, and I went to my grade 11 English teacher, <clears throat> and I remember very distinctly, he was sitting at his desk in our homeroom looking for something in the bottom left hand of his desk, and I walked up and I said, sir, is it possible to make a living from creative writing? And without looking up, he said, no, not really. <laughs> so, and then, oh, <laughs> I know, I know. <clears throat> and then a few months later, I went to my mother, and I told my mother I wanted to be a writer. And my mother looked at me with a really perplexed look and said, why do you want to be a writer? It's not going to get you anywhere. And I fully understand this. My mother had a great sex education. Her first language was Anishinaabe Moen. Um, she basically cooked and cleaned for most of her life. And the idea of being a writer was just not on her radar. <clears throat> so with all of that, um, I actually gave up writing, gave up the thought of writing, because I hadn't really started writing until my mid-20s. And so I never actually have taken a writing course in wow. anything. That's I've incredible. written novels, plays, creative nonfiction, etc. I just um, learned by doing and by reading. So were you always a reader, like when you were little? Oh, yeah. I remember. I remember... I think I must have been five. 
I remember sitting on the steps of our house on my lap. I had a stack of comic books that thick, <laughs> right? Because I loved looking at the pictures and stuff. And my mother used to clean cottages. <clears throat> and when the people would come and they'd leave, they'd leave behind magazines, books, comic books, all these different things. And my mother had to clean it up and she'd bring home magazines, books, comic books, whatever. She'd give them to me. And I remember sitting there with a stack of comic books on my lap thinking, wow, next year I get to go to school and I'll actually be able to read these. <laughs> <laughs> and after not giving anything away, I did. Uh, with your comic books, um, and then moving into school, you didn't like have a journal or a diary or. No, I hated writing. Wow, I, that's I still, incredible. I, I still do. I, I, that I, I'm. <laughs> I think it was Dor it was Dorothy Parker who once said, "I hate writing, but I love having written." Yeah. <clears throat> and I, I adhere to that. So 30 years and this man has not changed. And I said backstage, like, we all women need to know what kind of cream he uses on his face. Because <laughs> he looks great. Like, I'm serious. I'm not joking. He looks I, exactly I, I go to insane. L.A. once a year for a touch-up. Oh. <laughs> No, you don't, because I would notice. Mm. I've seen, I've seen those touch, touch ups. <laughs> yeah. They're not all exactly pretty. <laughs> um, so, you do this. In, you you have this incredible knack um, for building and connecting a familiar and and an unfamiliar world in your um, novels and stories. And you weave these casts of characters that are so incredible. I'd, I'd really love to hear about your process <coughs> and, um, and, and also how you build your characters. I would give you an answer if I knew. Um, I, it, it's, it's hard to say because, again, I don't know how I do what I do. I get asked frequently if I want to teach a course in, in writing or mentor or whatever. And simply because I learned by doing, I don't know how I do what I do. And that's mm -hmm. not being facetious or anything of that nature. It's just I sit down and I write it. Now, with that being said, you know, um, we have a friend, or we had a friend, um, Daniel David Moses. Yes. Who used to say um, he would sit down at the computer and he had no idea where his fingers would take him. Mm. He would just spontaneously write something and something would come of it. Michael Andachi was like that. He would, he would come, have an image in his mind, and he would work on that image, and then it would grow from that image. <clears throat> I'm not like that. Um, I'm one of these people that, in order for me to start a journey, I have to know the destination. Mm. And I know so many people, leaving the metaphor behind, who actually like to go out for a journey and drive, for a literal drive. They don't actually, they just like to go for a drive and see where they end up. I am so not like that. So. <laughs> when I'm working on a novel, a play, or whatever, I spend about six months to a year planning it out in my head so that I know, um, by the end of it, I know my opening line, my closing line, the, the act break, or the middle section, so that when I'm sitting down to start working on something, I know, um, I know about 60% of the story and how it's going to happen. And if you write your story well enough and your characters well enough, they'll take over the other 40% and, and take you the rest of the way. Wow. So do you mm. add your characters in or you know your sometimes. characters as you're it thinking? It depends on the story. Sometimes, sometimes like it mostly plays, uh, but not necessarily. Sometimes, sometimes I'll come up with a, a set of characters that I need, I need a play for them. Right. Other times I have a play idea that I need characters for. I'll give you an example. One of my, one of my plays is called um, Dead White Writer on the Floor. Oh, yes. <clears throat> I know that play. And it's an exploration of stereotypes of, of, of Native characters in movies. And so I had the, the Indian princess. I had the, um, the wise old elder, the bloodthirsty warrior, the, uh, the, the, the half-breed, uh, all, all these characters you find in a lot of literature. White, basically, these are stereotypes created by white writers. And so I wanted to do something on stereotypes, but I didn't know what. So I suddenly had these characters, and I, then I had to come up with a play to use them. Mm -hmm. So I ended up doing, um, basically, uh, Pirandello meets Highway. 
<clears throat> and uh, so, in, and that's, then I did another, I had another series of plays I wanted to do someday in Only Drunks and Children, where I wanted to explore the scoop up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I, in order to explore the scoop up, I had the idea, but then I developed the characters to fit the story. So it, it, it depends on, on how I come up with that original idea for, for the play or the novel. Right, right, wow. I imagine you with this like magical little book that you carry around taking notes all the time. I do not. It's all in your head. Yes, it's That's no. incredible. I actually do have a book. What it is, if, uh, the best way to, it's like picking up, I guess, I don't know, um, popcorn kernels. If the idea is big enough, if it's, an, if, it, if it's an important piece of the story that this will lead to this, which will lead to this, will lead to this, there's no possible way I could forget it because there'll be a piece missing. Right. So it, it's all organic. <laughs> However, I'll come up with a line, a funny little thing, uh, something, will, something ironic will be on the shelf behind them, that kind of thing. Then I write it down. And then I do the first or second draft, and I remember I have this book, and I go back and say, did I put this in? No, I didn't. And I run in, and I go put it in. <laughs> so it's the little things that will fall between your yeah. fingers yeah. I forget, and I make a note of. The big right. stuff, uh, if it's big enough, uh, you, there's no possible way you can, you can not include it because the, the, the story as you're writing it won't make sense. Right. I'm, but I'm also fascinated by the, I have my opening line and my closing mm. line. Now, as a, that can all change, of course. I've done, um, I've done stuff where I've had to, well, I did a novel called uh, Night Wanderer, a native vampire story. Yes. And I ended up taking out a third of it because I, it was two running storylines that my, my publisher editor thought would be too confusing for teenagers. So take this out and just stay with the main one. So I did that. So things change in the process. But you need a blueprint before you can start building. Mm -hmm. And then you can augment the blueprint as you go along. Wow. I, I never, ever thought that's how you uh, wrote. Do you base any of your characters on people you meet or I get asked family? that occasionally and I think I tried that once or twice but I, I found myself literally saying what would so and so do in this situation and I found it very very limiting right so I don't bother doing that I have a sub couple of older grandparent characters in it that are I guess loosely based on my own grandparents mm -hmm. but not that closely but how do you build those characters like in cold <clears throat> which Everybody has to get today. Um, and isn't this a great cover? I love this cover. Um, the characters are so interesting and so different. Like, and, but you build them up and uh, you, know, you fall in love with some of the characters. Can't give away too much. Um, I got, I, I'm just amazed, and it's the same with Someday, and you know, these, all of your plays, which I'm most familiar with over the years because of our theater connection. I got, I'm, I'm amazed that you, there's so much, <clears throat> much depth to them. Like, how do you, I, like you're, when you're building your story, are you building that character at the same time? I, I was once on a talk show with uh, Evan Adams. Oh, yes. Remember Beautiful. Uh, uh, Buffalo Tracks? Yes. And Evan looked at me and said, how can you write such deep characters when you're so shallow? <laughs> I wouldn't that say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> um, it's, I, like when you're writing a play, uh, Arthur Miller once said, I can describe more through one page of dialogue than 10 pages of prose, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, theater is dialogue driven and you, you have to be able to, to tap in and understand what people say, how they say it, and why they say it. Mm -hmm. Whereas novels are more internal dialogue. Yeah. You know, I've, um, uh, I shudder at the idea of having to, I was jokingly talking about doing cold as a play and I have no idea how I would do that because there's so much of it is internal. That's yeah. why the characters are so unique by how they think, the choices they make, but they don't just stand there saying, I am going to make this choice because of this reason. Right. Um, 
And it's, it, it's fun. I'm sitting there typing away, and they have to have an action. I think, why would they have this action? Oh, that makes sense. And I type that in. And gradually, it's just layer upon layer upon layer until hopefully, uh, you know, one of the old writing addicts is make your, make your characters as three-dimensional and as complex as your best friend. Mm -hmm. Well, you're a genius at it, honestly. And, uh, you know, I'll say more later, but that'll be in the back room. <laughs> um, you know, cold is uh, fast-paced, page-turning. Um, it's a murder mystery. It's extremely intense in parts, um, especially the big W. Um, <laughs> it's fun, you know, I, I enjoyed reading it. Um, it takes you from the cold in the north to the cold, dark, damp, gray sky Toronto and, and, and darkness, the night, right? <clears throat> Um, I, I appropriately read it right at the cold snap in <laughs> January Excellent. under a blanket. So why Toronto? Why do you do that? Well, I did a book uh, several years ago, 10 years ago, called Motorcycles and Sweetgrass. Oh, yeah. And that was similar in nature. I took a character from indigenous um, mythology, cosmology, and contemporized them, and put him in a contemporary world where he goes to. He's the trickster character, and I put him on a vintage 1953 Indian chief motorcycle for irony's sake, and sent him towards a First Nations community in the midst of a banned election. <laughs> uh, uh, they've got a whole chunk of. They've got 300 acres given to them to try to figure out. So basically, I took this character of chaos and appetites in the midst of this, of this community that, as, as one of the characters says, needs to be smartened up. And so I did that, and, and it was a, a pretty successful book. I really enjoyed the reaction to it. And then I was working on, a, I, was, I was beginning to sort of come together with this, and I thought, well, why not do the same but completely different, where I take a... Um, a, again, a character from indigenous mythology, cosmology, and uh, contemporize him and urbanize him. Uh, him, her, whatever term you want to use. Because the interesting thing about many indigenous languages is they're gender neutral. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and put him, the first one took place in the summer and on the reserve. So I thought, let's have this one happen in the winter <laughs> in a big city. Right. I thought and that would be fun and interesting. And I've never really, the first part of um, Chasing Painted Horses takes place in a city briefly, but I just wanted to, to, to revel in the cold, dark essence of Toronto. <laughs> well, you have in this novel. And the title, Cold? Cold. Well, it's a cold snap in Toronto. <laughs> and basically, I guess, I, you know, everybody here will probably figure out pretty quick. That's a story about what, uh, a, a creature we call either the Windigo or the Witigo, and um, it's a it's a it's a it's a winter spirit. It's a, most people think of it as a cannibal spirit. Just that's all. But like many stories within um, the First Nations community, it's so much more than that because our, our traditional tales and legends were uh, conveyed philosophy, conveyed history, wor um, world comprehension, um, uh, history, etc. all these different things. And what at its core the story is about is the danger of appetite, about you know, hunger being the most obvious one, but anything... Um, greed. Greed, hunger, sex, uh, whatever. The whole thing of the more, you, the more you have, the more you want, that there's no satisfying <laughs> you. So that's the whole metaphor of, of the creature. Oh, you describe it so well in here. I, you know, on page 204, you had described it so well, and I, you know, I, that's exactly where I was going to go into the big W. And... <laughs> You know, I'm, I, I feel like if I say it three times, I know, it's like appears. Beetlejuice, you know, it's going to appear. It should um, also be mentioned that, you know, it is, um, while it is a cannibal yeah. spirit, there's still, there's still a certain amount of respect that goes towards it from the First Nations community be, um, because it is, I guess you could say, one of our ancestors. Um, and I forgot, there was something else I was going to say, but I forgot. <laughs> But Windigo, ooh, I said it. You said it. It's two times now. 
Um, you know, without giving too much away, it's like you weaved it sneakily into almost every character. That, and I, I will be honest, that was a surprise for me. I remember talking with my publisher because I was like doing it. It's, it's, um, it's a ghost story. It's a horror story. It's a comedy. It's almost a buddy novel. Yeah. Uh, it's all these different things. I tried to throw everything but the kitchen sink into it. And it's also a police procedural. And I'd never done a mystery police procedural before. I'd never thought I could do one. And I wasn't aiming to do it. I was just doing the logical progression. You've got a creature in Toronto killing people and eating people. What would be the process my central characters would have to go through or, or to, to find this creature? And I'll, I was just, it was just a matter of being logical and following and then creating situations and characters that would help with that storyline. Mm -hmm. And I, at the end, I remember going to my, my, my editor going, does it make sense as a procedural? I've never written one before. Could I write for Law and Order? <laughs> you know, one of those things. And evidently, I, it was okay. Yeah. You know, the new Toronto one is coming out <laughs> yeah, next month. Yeah, I heard. <laughs> I could see you writing for them. <laughs> Some creepy, windigo, crazy, greedy character, which is what I wanted to ask you about. What are your views on a contemporary version? It's in your book, but it's all around us, really. Well, of course, this, this is a, so a society of consumption and of greed. And, and yeah, that's why I picked the, the Windigo, or the W, as she calls it, <laughs> for downtown Toronto. I, uh, I went to school at Seneca College at, at Don Mills and uh, York Mills a thousand years ago. <laughs> and I used to know this area quite well because I lived at Bathurst and uh, Finch. And I haven't, I, I haven't been back here, I'd say, in about 20 years. And my God, this is all changed. There's big buildings everywhere. It's just consumer, consumer, consumer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what I enjoyed about your weaving because it brings, it questions the mythology or cosmology of the big W, right? Yeah. And, and because it's present in our lives every day. So I really, um, I really, that's your genius, though, within this book of weaving that into all those So you characters. think I have a future in this industry? I don't know. You know, I think you need to write a, a 35 more. <laughs> I've got the summer off. I was thinking, wow, I wonder how many more books Drew will write in the rest of his life. Well, I'll, be, I'll, I'll let you in on something. I, I assume, according to my publisher and editor out there, when I, when I gave them this book and they read it, and I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially they said, there's one problem with this book. And I said, what's that? It needs a sequel. Ah, yay. Ooh, that's interesting. So ah. I'm going to start working on that this summer. I'm like, ooh, which characters are going to come back? That's, see, that's what I have to figure out. There are one, two, uh, three, four characters involved uh, in the that survive the story. That's right. And I have to think, do I bring them all back? Do I just bring two or three? I got I to figure out the story yet, which is going to be the hard part. Speaking of characters, I loved all the <clears throat> strong female characters that were in here. My favorite, Katie. Everybody You're, loves Katie for some I, reason. I loved Katie. Um, and of course, Paul North. The studly, I heard a hmm. studly hockey player, you know. The over the hill hockey player that I, we've all met. Yes, we've all met. I feel like he's from my res, mm. you know. Like I totally have met this guy. I'm sure. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's move into first professor. Elmore Trent. Okay. So, you know, fascinating. Kind of weakish man at times, um, which is also what... Well, both of them are. See, that's the thing. The women are strong, the men are weak. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, sort of. Kind of, but the hockey player comes through at some point. So, you know... All right, all right. He's kind of the hero stud of the story in the end, in a weird sort of way. Maybe, and I'm giving the story away. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, Elmore, Professor Elmore Trent, um, what I noticed was 
In the beginning, you called him Elmor, but in the half of the novel, he was Elmor, and then the other half, he was Trent. And I found that really interesting, because then I was like, switch, like, what? How come he's calling him Trent now? And, and because I started thinking his name, it was like you were a trickster in, the, in your writing. Um, so Trent, is there, was, there, was that on purpose? Well, first part, Elmore, he's with people he knew, he knows. The, the, the ha back half, he's with people he's just met. Right. So it's like... True, knowing... yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, I get you'll, you'll give me that? Yeah, I'll, <laughs> give, it, I'll give it to you, I guess. Um, and then Trent, uh, is this related to where you're from and your community? I know where you're going. Um, well, Elmore Trent is a, I, I like to think of him as a borderline alcoholic professor of native literature at a prominent Toronto University. <laughs> um, but basically, he was a residential school survivor who never went home and basically knows his community through its writings, through its literature. So that's how he, f he manages to figure out, well, again, we're giving away too much here. Yeah. Um, but uh, she's referring to Trent University, which is a prominent university that's about 20, 25 minutes from my reserve. And I like, uh, I, uh, from which I got my uh, third... Honorary doctorate. Uh, wow, in, that's uh, last fantastic. Summer. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah me educated. <laughs> um, Even though you never studied. I'd right? never been to university, but I did go to Trent. Uh, when I was 16, I painted the residences at uh, one of the colleges. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I wondered if it had something, some correlation to Trent. So part of the fun of doing these things is coming up with the names. Sometimes they don't mean anything, sometimes they do. And Motorcycles and Sweetgrass, um, published by Random House, available at your local bookstore. <laughs> <coughs> the, the character of John has a whole bunch of different last names that are not randomly picked. They're, 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 they're comments and references to various elements of colonization. Mm -hmm. So in this one, um, as I said, I, I picked Trent for that, Paul North, etc., cetera, and, and things like that I just had fun picking around with. The best example I can give you of, of sometimes name mean, names meaning something and not meaning something, I wrote a, a, a trilogy of plays called Someday, Only Drunks and Children Tell the Truth, and 400 Kilometers, where it was about um, the scoop up, and it's about a, a, a girl who was taken away, discovers where her parents are, and comes home, and it's about the reintegration of her into the family and stuff like that. Her birth name was um, uh, Grace, but she, when her adopted name was Janice. And this woman, a, stu a student who was, uh, um, I think, working on her master's on indigenous literature, uh, called me up and asked to interview me. And so we, were, we, we met for coffee, and she was interviewing me about it. And she said, first of all, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm basing chapter three of my, of my um, major thesis on only drunks and children tell the truth. And I think it's brilliant. I think what you did was really, really fabulous. And I think it was a stroke of pure geniusness to name your adopted child Janice Grace. Mm. And I went, oh, really? Why? And she said, well, it's obvious. Janus is a reference to the Roman god Janus, who is the oh, two-faced no. god that can look backwards and forwards, and it's a perfect metaphor for an adopted child. And I'm sitting there going, oh, you caught that. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first one to catch that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, and Paul Nor North, because he is a northern hockey player. Um, yeah, and I'm... <laughs> grown up with guys like that, for sure. He, he brings so much relief, though, also, to this very dark kind of scary story. And humor's always been a part of who you are as a person, but also in all of your writing. Mm -hmm. Why is that so important to you? <coughs> well, it was I'm sure you get asked that every time. Uh, actually, I was having a discussion today on Zoom the Indigenous Tourism Association wants me to do a speech on Indigenous humor at a conference. Um, well, I mean, for me, uh, I, think, I think we had this discussion at dinner tonight. Um, 
I came of age, and I think you came of, of age in terms of life in Toronto during what I refer to as the contemporary uh, indigenous literary renaissance. Mm. There's this explosion of native uh, theater and novels out of nowhere, late 80s, early 90s. Right, and there was, uh, there was this explosion. Of, uh, I, I started out working in theater, and but I began. We were this. fifteen. <laughs> and dog ears. <laughs> and um, the, what I began to notice about all the plays and novels coming out then is that the vast majority of them were dark, depressing, bleak, sad, and angry. Mm -hmm. Almost all the characters were either oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. Yeah. Right? And, and it makes sense. When, when an oppressed people get their voice back, chances are they're going to write about being oppressed. Mm -hmm. And Thompson Highway has that great line he, he uses, before the healing can take place, the poison must be exposed. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I was coming of age and then, and I was like watching all this, and I was like, this all makes perfect, perfect sense, but I don't know if, I, if that's the tone I want to take. Mm -hmm. uh, I would look at my mother, um, I'm a single parent growing up on the reserve, um, raising me on the reserve, and my mother was not oppressed, depressed, or suppressed. My mother had a very vivacious sense of humor, and I wasn't really seeing her. And by sheer luck, as I was searching for a voice, a path in the Renaissance, I bumped into a man from um, the Blood Reserve in Alberta who told me that, in his opinion for Native people, humor was the WD-40 of healing. Mm -hmm. And I heard that, and I thought, that is so cool. And it's true. I mean, I've been to 150 First Nation communities across Canada and the United States, and everyone I've been to, I've been greeted with a laugh, a smile, and a joke. Yeah. And to me, that is the essence of the Native experience. And um, so it became important to me to make sure it was reflected in a lot of our, in, in a lot of my work, because, uh, I mean, I was, uh, Again, I was telling the story at dinner tonight, um, these two wonderful stories, uh, both sad and funny. Um, my, I, my mother's the oldest of 14, right? Wow. Which is what used to happen before they had the internet. <laughs> and so we have lots and lots of, uh, of, of aunts, uncles, cousins, etc. And one of my aunts got sick and was in the uh, ICU in the hospital. And so as is the tradition, you go in, you, you, you go into the, the guest room, whatever it's called, and you sit and you wait until whatever happens, happens, or if she gets better or whatever. And so there were about 12 to 15 of us waiting, and we were talking and laughing. And it got to the point where a nurse had to come in and tell us to keep it down. You're in the ICU. There are people sleeping here. You're being very disrespectful because <laughs> we were just laughing yeah. out loud. Roaring. And when my, when my mother passed away, um, we went to the funeral directors in Lakefield and two of my aunts, two cousins, um, all women, and my partner were there talking to the funeral director about my mother's funeral. And again, we were laughing. Um, like, my mother had the nerve to die in late January, um, and her favorite flower was um, sunflowers. She loved sunflowers. Aww. But the problem being, it was like a week after Chinese New Year, mm. and uh, the Chinese community had hoovered up all <laughs> the, the sunflowers in southern and central Ontario. <laughs> so uh, we knew my mother would be so angry we had to get something else. Anyways, we man we, all, the while, all the while downstairs there was a wake happening. We're up there laughing, and at the, we finally managed to get everything planned that we were getting up to leave, and the funeral director stood up, reached over, shook my hand, and he said, I never get to say this, but that was fun. Uh, <laughs> wow. So, so it's just, wow. uh, it's the best of my knowledge, yeah. it's, it's, it's who we are. It's, it's how we've survived three, four, five hundred years of colonization. Mm -hmm. It's a humor. Yeah, I've and one of the things I found too, because I've, I used, I've wrote com just straight comedies that I used to think were just sheer celebrations of the indigenous sense of humor with absolutely no social redeeming qualities whatsoever. And I had my, my, my wrist slapped by um, <laughs> Tom Hill, mm. who was in, do you remember he was in, I think it was the Buzzkin Blues. Yes, I remember him being in. But, yeah. yeah, and I said that, and he said, no, 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 no. He said, you know, you make some really interesting points about absentee fatherism, all these different issues in the First Nations community. And I sort of began to revise, and I come to the conclusion you know, that comedy, humor, is commentary. 
that whenever we're making, we're, we're writing a joke, making a joke, or talking about something funny, there's a point to it that has, we have been influenced by the dominant culture, about colonization, all these things. So I remember one very prominent artistic director says, I don't do comedies. I want something with substance. The very fact that it's an indigenous comedy says a lot within itself. Yeah, yeah. Well, and comedy is weaved into so many stories, <laughs> even if they are trying to be harsh. You know, there's always an element of comedy. Yes. You know, I find even in some of those, some of those writers or artistic directors who might go that route, it finds itself in there. Of course, there. it yeah. will not die. Yeah, and that's what's you know really wonderful about um, your book. And so to step back and go back to. Um, the, the person who had all those connections to, um, what was it, Janice? Grace. Grace. Um, your fans, you have many, many fans. I mean, I have seen you swarm. Me and Justin Bieber. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, at least you didn't say um, uh, you're, you know, Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> Swiftians? You're a Druian. <laughs> I Dr hate Drew Bellers. Yeah. <laughs> um, what have you learned from your fans over these 30-some years? Well, I mean, one of the things I've learned as a writer that people tell me, and it goes back to exactly to Janice Grace, is sometimes when you're going for those metaphors, that symbolism, whatever, a third of it, you, you hit it on, uh, right on the nose. A third of it is, I think, unconscious. You're aiming for something, and you don't know if you've hit it or not. You just sort of like, let's let the dust settle. And the third is completely by accident, mm. right? It's, just, it's, it's there. You didn't know it was there. Uh, it's all, all good and great. Um, but what I, what I really find is how much, like are you talking about fans, uh, sometimes fans, sometimes readers, not just fans, readers just want a good old-fashioned tale. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been having conversations with with, with, with with people, and you know, a lot of our a lot of our literature, literature deals with issues and and how we're surviving this. And um, I like to think of myself as a contemporary storyteller. Right. We uh, storytelling used to be primarily oral. We told stories around the campfire or across the kitchen table with tea. And as civilization and people evolved, so did storytelling. We began to tell stories through. Um, radio, television, movies, um, print, etc. And even today, video games have deep and intricate narrative woven into mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So people always want a good and interesting story. So that's what I try and do. I try and sit down and write a good and interesting story with the three things I try and put in. I try and entertain, I try and educate, and I try and illuminate. Right. In various orders. Uh, and in and, and, and various places. Mm -hmm. And do your writer, are your um, writers, do your uh, readers know this about you? Do you get? I get, a, I get, yeah, I get a lot of positive reaction and I get a lot of weird comments. <laughs> and share, it, do share. <laughs> and uh, one person commented, I just read your motorcycles and sweetgrass. Um, I have a question. In it, your central character rides a 1953 Indian oh, motorcycle. No. <laughs> Why is the title plural? <laughs> <laughs> Motorcycles and sweetgrass. Wow. That and there's weird. only one motorcycle. Why is that? Yeah. It sounds better. I, 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 I don't know. It's funny because I, you know, I, I admit I started searching to see what people said, especially Amazon, you know, it's on Amazon right now. And I started looking and I, and one person wrote, it's really great, it's fast paced, it's fun, um, or, it's interesting, uh, easy read. But I didn't learn anything. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what do you mean? What, because he's indigenous or because he's a writer? What does that mean, right? 
And I, and I was offended by that. I wanted to write back to them. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure you remember when I was talking about the uh, contemporary indigenous uh, literary renaissance, what it's, what's called uh, that period, most, a lot of literature was called trauma porn. Right, yes. Right, because people think, in, and I, I, I've had yeah, this, yeah, uh, yeah, people yeah. think if you're an indigenous writer, you've got to have angst, you've mm -hmm. got to have pain. Or you have to give um, a, a teaching. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Different things like that. You know, it's like if you watch a documentary on anything indigenous, there's got to be flutes. Yes, flutes and eagles. Or flutes and ah, feathers. Ah, and yes. feathers. Um, speaking of other writers, you um, give such a beautiful homage to many. Why was that important to you? Well, um, Elmar was, a, was a, a, a prof of indigenous literature. And I just wanted to see, like, one of the things one person said, I don't know, uh, some people had, how can I put this? I don't want people to think this is necessarily my view of these, of these books. This is what I think his view would be. And in it, he just does, like, a quick one-off, two, three lines about um, uh, Dry Lips Out of Move to Capus Casing. Yes. And uh, yes. I think uh, Wabagisha Rice's first book. Wab, there's, oh, my gosh, I probably have it. Because I was like, oh, cool, he's mentioning, I don't even know who else. It's probably in the Yeah, it's about, about five or six books in there. There's quite Almanac a few. Of the Dead. Yeah. And all these things where he's, he's sort of giving a little mini review of it from his perspective. And I'm yeah. like, um, there's also the two couple, the, the two couple in a restaurant talking about yes. a, a dry lips out of move to Capus Casing, right? and Katie. Right? Yep, okay. yep. Yeah. So the, anyways. Oh, the, no, the no, couple who were sitting at it. When they see the two native they, people walking yeah. inside. Oh, I saw a native play once. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And they talk about uh, uh, Dry Lips and the Capus Casey, whether it's a play about misogyny or is it a misogynistic play, <laughs> which was a big discussion at the time. It was, and still is sometimes when it does come up to uh, show that play. I had a funny, um, I used to do sound design and I think it was someday. Was that where, where Carol Roundtree and Herbie were on stage at the Native Center and it was Stefan Droves? Yes, 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 yes. Well, there were all these really fast change, costume changes, and um, I, don't, I, I don't know, I can't remember who it was. She was the older character and she went backstage. Oh, it was Lee Miracle. She went backstage and she had this really quick, and her nylons went over her costume. And, but she came out and so her nylons behind her were over her dress in the back. Well, everybody on stage was trying not to laugh and Herbie kept trying to go behind her <laughs> and pull it. Well, I swear we stopped for a full five minutes Everybody was laughing, and, and the play itself is, you know, quite witty in Drew's amazing way of crafting story.